case at 12. The night beat starts right now. Hail heard in and around San Antonio tonight. This is viewer video shared with us near Lavernia. There were some concerns for cars that may have felt the brunt of this Monday hail storm. Viewers also sent in pictures of hail they picked up from their front yards. Some as small as a quarter, others as big as baseballs. Meteorologist Adam Kasky has been tracking it all for us tonight. Adam. I really want to stress right now the threat is gone. It's out of here. What we're looking at here are the paths and the tracks that those hail cores took. We had one that moved north through Bernie and then the main hail was moving from the west side of San Antonio through downtown Highway 90 I 10 area, then eastward toward New Berlin and then even south of Seguin before it completely dissipated and there's nothing left of it. But what you're seeing here are the paths that the big swaths of hail took right through the central part of San Antonio. Good chunk of it. This is what the storms looked like. See, we had a couple of them. One of them moved northward than the main one right along Highway 90 I 10. And then now east of Seguin moving toward Luling, nothing left. It is all fallen apart. So the focus is shifting now to what's going to be happening later tonight, and we're not expecting more of that activity, but a cold front's going to be dropping in some cooler air behind it, lower humidity, some very noticeable changes to talk about and more hail pictures coming right up. Thank you, Adam. Damaged roof, shattered windows, just some of the aftermath residents living in Dehanis are dealing with after a tornado touched down last week. With some residents being uninsured, they are hoping for federal assistance. The night team's Jaffney Gray spoke with residents who are left waiting for an answer. We shut all the doors around us, and then about 723 is when I heard all the windows just shattering in the house. Bank will be alive, but now sorting out the storm damage. 10, 15, 20,000. The roof alone is going to cost at least 20,000. The head is resident Suzanne Cook is praying for federal assistance from FEMA. There's a lot of people that lost a lot in this town. Yes, we're a little town, but we we still have people and we still need help just like the big cities do. Insurance adjuster Thomas Flores says they've been busy since the severe hail damage and tornado that touched down Wednesday. The best we can tell people is it's going to be anywhere between the three to 10 days out to be able uh, to get people taken care of, but we were that swamped. From what he's seen, he believes. There will be federal assistance on this because, uh, I mean, they're not going to let people just hang out there like that. Kay Markle is skeptical. She's the president of the board of directors for this RV co-op, which caters to those 55 and older. I would appeal to anyone who can get us some help with funding on some of this stuff because we are all retired people. We don't have an income. We are retired. Many of us just living on Social Security. Like her neighbors, Markle is dealing with the aftermath of the storm. This is your home. And, you know, I mean, people live in these, and, and suddenly you can't live in these. Any help that we could get from any source would be wonderful. Jaffany Gray, KSAT 12 News. A spokesperson with the Texas Division of Emergency Management says they are working with the Red Cross to conduct damage assessments in Medina County to determine whether the damages meet federal requirements for disaster assistance. If your home or business was damaged by last week's storms, you can fill out a report with the state by visiting the website there on your screen. The information will also be available on KSAT.com. And from the damage from last week, let's go to more damage from tonight. Not just hail that was left behind. Lightning also blamed for some damage, including to a home on the northeast side. Firefighters called out to a home on Castle Run Drive. That's just north of Ritterman Road and Gibbs Sprawl. The night team's Patty Santos is live right now on the scene. Patty. Yeah, investigators here getting some help from neighbors who say uh, they heard the strike and they saw the flash when they went outside. They saw their neighbor's roof was on fire. Take a look. Firefighters just wrapping up the scene here. Uh, but here's what they can tell us. Based on the evidence they found inside, it looks like this was a lightning strike. They also ruled out the fact that this house is under construction right now and it doesn't have any electricity or gas. So uh, that's the good news. Right now, they're actually trying to get in contact with the owner of this house. So if this looks like your house, you might want to give the fire department a call. Again, nobody was hurt, but this was a lightning strike. We'll send it back to you. Thank you, Patty. A bill allowing Texans to carry a handgun without a license inching closer to Governor Abbott's desk. 
House Bill 1927 seeks to do away with the license to carry requirement for those 21 and older. The night team's Patty Santos busy today and she talked to the bill's author and tells us why several groups, including law enforcement, are against this measure. Tyler Representative Matt Shaver says law-abiding Texans should be trusted with personal responsibility when it comes to handling guns. Criminals have an advantage over law-abiding citizens. And so it's time to restore faith in law-abiding Texans and allow them to more fully express their Second Amendment right to keep and to bear arms. He's the author of a bill that would allow those 21 and older to carry small firearms without a permit. He cites vulnerable women and those involved in domestic violence situations as examples for the need. They do not have the luxury of waiting weeks and weeks and weeks uh, for them to get a permission slip from the state of Texas to protect themselves. But there is strong pushback from many, including several law enforcement organizations who say they're worried about public safety. It's reasonable and important to ask that someone carrying a firearm in public know how to safely handle and store a gun and have a basic awareness of the laws related to weapons and the use of deadly force. Concerns echoed by those on the front line of weapons safety education. Firearms instructor Mike Taylor says some well-intentioned people don't know how to properly handle a deadly weapon. The students that I have coming into my class are, are not very prepared. And a, a lot of them are very nervous on the range. They have limited skills. And almost every other class, I have someone loading the bullets in the magazine backwards. Schaefer says Texans will still be held accountable for their actions. The laws against misuse of a firearm in Texas are very strong, and those laws will still be in place. That was Patty Santos reporting the measure would still be illegal for people to carry a gun into sensitive places like schools and courthouses. If approved by the Senate this week, it will need the governor's signature to become law this coming September. As CPS Energy tries to dig itself out of a massive financial hole following February's winter storm, we're learning more about the utility's finances, specifically what it spends to predict and analyze the weather. In this Defenders update, the night team's Dylan Collier found while CPS has forked over hundreds of thousands of dollars for a customized weather platform, it pays a college student a nominal fee to use it. <laughs> The nation's largest municipally owned energy utility gets its weather forecast from someone who, as of last week, was still studying meteorology at University of the Incarnate Word. A current student, not listed as a graduate, according to a UIW spokesman. Invoices obtained by the defenders show the weather contractor, who refers to himself as Kid Coldfront on one social media platform, has never been paid more than $716 in a single week. CPS officials refused to say how many hours he'd worked in any given pay period. His income often dwarfed by what the utility shells out for its customized weather platform. CPS paying that other three-letter company, DTN, nearly 120 grand in a single 21-month period. Paula Gold Williams was not made available for an interview for this story. Our camera kept on the other side of a glass partition during last week's board meeting due to what the utility called social distancing measures. The embattled president and CEO hasn't answered questions from KSAT since March 12th. We have not uh, finalized all of the storm costs. The utility's chief financial officer, Gary Gold, last week could not say why his company pays so much for weather mapping and graphics and then so little to have them analyzed. I really do not have the information to be able to answer that question for you. Criticism for CPS Energy has come in bunches over its handling of February's extreme weather event, including the hundreds of millions of dollars it paid for natural gas bills it's now fighting in court not to pay. The utility has also been slammed for not having a licensed meteorologist on staff. I come with my own biases and prejudices. I mean, I, you know. Judah Cohen is a Columbia University educated climatologist. He says companies that rely on the weather should not only have meteorologists, but would benefit from having someone with a background in weather research. When it comes to the polar vortex itself, we're not 
capitalizing on, on our ability to maybe predict it uh, and what the impacts are. Impacts like widespread cold and snowfall in the U.S. that Cohen was predicting way before the storm's arrival in Texas. In this news article, January 8th, Cohen described an out of whack, wandering polar vortex, the rotating air that brought historic sub freezing temperatures to South Texas. I think useful information for this event really lied more in the research than in the operations, but it certainly could have been very beneficial to, to the stakeholders, you know, to the, you know, certainly here, the, the, the energy companies, the energy infrastructure. For the Defenders, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. We need all the support, all of the San Antonio family and community. We need y'all's help. Well, the call is out to San Antonio art students at one local high school making waves in a nationwide competition. How you can help them win, coming up. And the roadway is drying out after the storms rolled through tonight. We're going to check in with meteorologist Adam Kasky for an update on what to expect for the rest of your work week. Plus, one vaccine developer is expecting to expand its use to a younger age bracket when the announcement is expected and who it will impact. Next on the Night Beat. An update on the vaccine rollout here at home. Mayor Ron Nuremberg says 58% of Bear County residents have it have received at least one dose of the vaccine. 40% have both doses. We're also learning the Pfizer vaccine may be made available to even more people. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration is expected to authorize Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine for those between the ages of 12 to 15 by next week. That's according to a federal official familiar with the process. A vaccine for younger children is expected by the fall. More job opportunities being made available tomorrow. More than 74 businesses participating in a virtual job fair. But so far, only 58 job seekers have registered. Workforce Solutions Alamo holding a virtual job fair from 9 in the morning until 2 p.m. tomorrow. Businesses like the JW Marriott, San Antonio Hill Country, Hyatt Regency, McAllister's Deli, the Tower of the Americas, and many, many more are looking to add their workforce. And right now there's more companies there than people looking for jobs. Quite an opportunity. There's still time to sign up. You can go to WorkforceSolutionsAlamo.org. Show me your shoes. The phrase is often heard during Fiesta, and one group of students is using San Antonio culture as inspiration in a nationwide competition. The art students at Edison High School are competing to win $50,000 to help their art program. It's all part of the Vans Custom Culture Competition. Voting is already underway, and Edison High School is in the top 50 spot. They hope to get to the top five with their San Antonio style. So these are the shoes. I have the Alamo, and then I have the Riverwalk, and then I have Papel Picado. Uh, and then in the back, I have SATX. <laughs> um, and so they were inspired, of course, by San Antonio. I want a pair now. Yeah, Rogelio Zamaripa is a junior at Edison High School and the lead artist for this project. But he's not the only one. Maya Lopez and Baimirka Wong teamed up to create another pair of shoes featuring popular sweet treats. And so one thing we thought of was on So that's one of our main components in here. And we also did embroidery in the back. This is our hand did embroidery right here. Those are amazing. Their teacher, Desiree Boone, stumbled upon the competition and was not only met by support of her students, but also her fellow art teachers like Kimberly Garza. You can cast your vote for Edison High School every day through Friday to help them reach their goal. We have a link on KSAT.com. Those are good luck. Shoes. Yes. Yeah. Those shoes really have soul. No, oh, they do. Now I feel like a heel. <laughs> You're a little worn out, if you ask me. <laughs> oh, All right, beautiful. beautiful. It turned into a beautiful night. Yeah. I mean, it was a warm, muggy, sticky day. And a storm rolled through, Adam. Yeah, a storm, of course, uh, did roll through, especially hitting the south side of San Antonio, downtown, and even parts of the west and east side, even over towards St. Hedwig and whatnot. And that's all come to an end, and really, it dropped very large hail. I mean, we're talking baseball-sized hail, so unfortunately, very damaging hail in some parts of, uh, some parts of our area. The aquifer, it's happy. 
It's happy since last Wednesday when we really started to see this stormy pattern, but some cooler air is on the way. We're going to talk about all of that starting right now with a look at some more hail photos. This is some damage that we had in San Antonio. See the top of the windshield there and the central part of the windshield busted because of the large hailstones and even some uh, branches broken off the tree there from the hail. Quarter side, uh, quarter size near the AT&T Center. Uh, South Town, look at that. It's about two and a half inch, almost three inch diameter hail there. South Town, here's another one. And we love it when you give perspective uh, with you know, a ruler or a coin. Usually quarters are nice, golf balls, baseballs, uh, something to give it perspective. Golf ball and baseball size. And notice the variety of sizes here as well. This was San Antonio. There you have it, softball size off Sulphur Springs and South Foster Road. I believe that's closer to the Kirby area on the east side of town. So that was large. And this was just at one location in St. Hedwig. You get the small hail. Sometimes then you also get the big, large, rowdy hail. That is extremely damaging. Okay, that's gone. That's out of here. And actually, the rest of the week's looking very quiet. The aquifer is happy. It's up over 14 feet since last Wednesday. And parts of Bear County have seen anywhere from 5 to 10 inches of rain since last Wednesday. But the aquifer zone where we really like to see the rain is just between these, li these blue lines here. And we did get good rainfall, and it continues to rise and respond. So our storm's out of here. It's dissipated. Nothing left of it. Most of the activity is off to the north of us now. And they're closer to the main driving force, this upper level dip in the flow, which last week was farther south in a position to give us the widespread severe weather, even into the weekend with the heavy rain. This is a different one. It's further to the north. So we had that one or basically two little lone thunderstorms pop up. And the reason was we had a very unstable atmosphere today. It was like a two liter bottle of soda shaking up at the lid tied on really tight. So it was capped. Then the dry line moved in and the, you know, basically two times out of 10 that the dry line actually kickstarts severe weather. Well, this was one of those two times out of 10 where it happened and it developed the storms. They moved into town and it was also really hot as well south of town and that helped generate some of that instability. Now the dry line's moving westward. So Del Rio, Rock Springs, dry air, Dewey's in the 50s, still muggy elsewhere. Today, we had 17 hundredths of an inch at the airport, but more than an inch in other locations. Topped out at 94 degrees. Catula was over 100. Laredo was over 100. Del Rio was 102 with the record high. Right now, we're at 74 in town. Pleasanton's 81. Tomorrow morning, most of us in the 60s. So 62 Kerrville, 68 Carrizo Springs, 67 in San Antonio. By the afternoon, noticeably cooler. Catula about 92, but that's the exception. Bernie 79, New Braunfels 82 degrees the high. Lackland area 84 along with Elmendorf, so not as hot tomorrow. Bit breezy as well. Can't rule out a stray shower or thunderstorm in the morning. Otherwise sunny in 82, a north wind at times gusting up to 30 miles per hour. Then the rest of the week looking quiet, decent amount of sunshine and high stain below 90 until Mother's Day. All right, thank you, Adam. All right, Spurs lose a heartbreaker. Now they have to turn right around and head west. And they're playing almost at full strength, but Derek White, of course, still out and will be for the rest of the season. Does that make a difference? And the answer is no. When we come back, the Spurs are in Salt Lake City to take on the best in the West, the Utah Jazz. How's it going for them so far? Not good. And no fifth year option for Leighton Vander Esch from the Dallas Cowboys coming up. DeMar DeRozan, Yaka Pirtle back in the starting lineup tonight. Utah as the Spurs look to bounce back from last night's brutal overtime loss against the best in the West tonight, the Jazz. And in fact, both DeRozan and Porto come into the score combined right now as San Antonio's first eight points, including the shot by Pirtle. But the Spurs trail throughout the first quarter, thanks in part of the red-hot shooting of San Antonio native Jordan Clarkson. He hits a step back three to put the Jazz up 22-16. DeJounte Murray keeps the Spurs in this game late in the quarter with a pair of jumpers with San Antonio trails 31-22 after one. And the Jazz pull away in the second Rudy Gorbera wide open for the jam San Antonio heads into halftime down 60 to 43 let's see if they kind of close that gap a little bit and the answer is not really 66 47 now in the third quarter now that Derek White is done for the season others will have to step up to take his place including rookie Devin Vassell in the starting lineup and Lonnie Walker the fourth Pop has decided to keep Lonnie as Manu like role coming off the bench to provide the spark for the Spurs reserves the overtime loss to the beast of the east the Philadelphia 76ers on Sunday Walker turning quite the performance to lead the Spurs with 23 points and included three three-pointers off the bench. Is Lonnie comfortable with that role? Doing whatever I can for the team. You know, that's all I can do. 
Um, I know when, I, when I'm getting into the game, you know, I got to find my group, be aggressive, um, you know, slowly st trying to figure it out, you know, continuously watching film. But, you know, I know what I can do and I know what I cannot do, but I sure as hell can do more than what I can. He's somebody that, you know, is very athletic. He's very aggressive and he's fearless. Uh, and he's learning how to play. He's done a good job for us. You know, he scores. Uh, he's always trying. Uh, he's just got to keep learning. The Los Angeles Lakers have fallen on hard times once the best team in the NBA with a February record of 21 and 6. The Lakers have fallen to six, one spot out of the play in tournament after their 121 to 114 loss to the Raptors last night. A frustrated LeBron James who did not play in the final six and a half minutes because of soreness in his ankle and is out of the lineup for tonight's game against Denver, lashed out. If I'm not, uh, you know, 100% close to 100%, it don't matter, you know, where we land, you know, so. Um, you know, that's my mindset. And, um, you know, if this happens to uh, we end up at six or fifth or, or, or whatever the case may be, or if we end up in the, you know, the playoff, uh, whatever that thing is, wh whoever came up with that uh, need to be fired. Pro Football Coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. I thought he liked it. The Dallas Cowboys did not pick up the fifth-year option on linebacker Leighton Van Der Esch. That was revealed today by his agent, Ron Slavin, meaning Van Der Esch will become an unrestricted free agent after this coming season. Van Der Esch had a remarkable rookie season after the Cowboys made him a first-round draft pick in 2018. Wound up being named to the Pro Bowl, in fact, but questions about his durability have raised doubts. Since his first season, Leighton has missed 13 games in the last two seasons, starting with a neck injury that required surgery in 2019 and then missed six games last season because of a broken collarbone. Had the Cowboys picked up his option, he would have been guaranteed $9.1 million in 2022. That's not to say the Cowboys don't want him back, but it would be for guaranteed less money. But after selecting Micah Parsons with the first pick this year, Van Der Esch could be expendable. Three-time Indianapolis 500 winner Bobby Unser has passed away. Part of the only pair of brothers to win the greatest spectacle in racing died Sunday at his home in Albuquerque, New Mexico of natural causes. Unser won the Indy 500 in 1968, 75, and 81, while his younger brother, Al, is one of only three four-time Indy 500 winners in race history. Roger Penske, who is the new owner of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and was the owner for Unser's 1981 500 win, said, Bobby was a ferocious competitor on the track and his larger-than-life personality made him one of the most beloved and unique racers we have ever seen. Bobby Unser leaves us at the age of 87. The Central Catholic Buttons taking on Katie St. John, the 23rd, out of Caleb Park today in the Taps area baseball playoffs. Top of the first, button strike first. Damian Gonzalez knocks a base hit into left. Matthew Gauna rounds third. He will score. Central Catholic jumps out to a one nothing lead. Katie ties it up in the top of the fifth, but Gonzalez answers with a go-ahead RBI single in the bottom half of the inning. Central Catholic hangs on to a close one, 2-1. to one. Congratulations go out to San Antonio resident Patricio Pato Award, who won his first Indy car racing event at Texas Motor Speedway on Sunday, taking the checkered flag at the Expel 3 75 after prior to that never finishing better than 10th award was w born in mexico but his parents moved the family to san antonio and was able to take the lead with 23 laps to go when he passed joseph newgarden taking the checkered flag in what is now his home state very special for sure it's it's really cool to do it in a place that's very close to my heart it is very close to home um you know texas is the closest that i will ever have to racing in mexico hopefully we can change that in the future but um, you know, I lived here in, 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 you know, just four hours south of here in San Antonio for, for many years. I grew up there a lot of my teenage years. So, um, you know, I, I love coming here. It's a great place to do it. Lots of my family was here. So it's really cool to share this moment with them. And here's a photo of Patio holding the trophy that is about as big as he is on the plane right home. Congratulations. He's been actually here to the station. He's racing at the Circuit of America's track. But great to see the big win. That is a huge <laughs> trophy. Yes, it is. He's either Thank kissing you. it or it's fallen on top of it. Yeah, I think that's what's happened. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. We'll be right back. That's it for the night beat. Don't forget GMSA at 4.30 in the morning. Good night.